From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of Hot Chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Thanks for joining me today. I'm excited about my guest today. It's Jay Warner Wallace. The J stands for Jim, and that's how I'll be calling him. You're just trying to make it more uh, difficult, aren't you, Jim? I know. Sorry about that. Give my uh, best. Uh, uh, Jim is a homicide detective. Uh, he's a founding member of the Torrance Police Department Cold Case Homicide Unit. We've got a, a cold case detective on the other line here. Uh, he's investigated a number of high-profile cases and uh, has been featured on Dateline, NBC, and other TV episodes. He was an atheist who became a Christian. He cold-cased Christianity. As a matter of fact, he wrote a book called Cold Case Christianity and um, uh, has just a, a fantastic ministry in that area. He's written many books, Cold Case Christianity, Alive, God, God's Crime Scene, and has a new book out called Cold Case Christianity for Kids. Jim, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been fun to uh, just kind of track you from afar. We met a couple of years ago at uh, the NRB conference, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, great. As a matter of fact, you're going to be uh, in Nashville uh, on uh, November 12th, the Defending Truth Conference at Belmont University. You'll be one of the speakers, so uh, we can come see you then. I'm excited about yeah. that. Yeah, it's always fun. I mean, we've got a great, great lineup. Um, some of the kind of iconic figures in uh, defending the Christian worldview are going to be there. Norm Geisler is going to be there. His son, David Geisler. Those two guys, Erwin Lutzer is going to be there. Ed Stetzer is going to be there. And, of course, Troy, the uh, president and CEO of uh, NRB TV, he'll also be there. So it should be a good, good time for all. We had Troy on the show last week, so uh, this okay. is very timely. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, he's, he's uh, obviously he's done great things with uh, NRB TV, so I'm looking forward to seeing everybody again. So let's uh, kind of just get into the story a little bit here. Let's talk about as being a homicide detective, how did you transition into uh, doing cold case work? Well, I uh, we at the time had some unsolved. You know, all, all cold cases are all homicides because there's a statute of limitations on other kinds of crimes like robberies or thefts or you know burglaries. Those kinds of crimes have a statute of limitations. After a certain number of years, you can't prosecute those cases anymore. But that isn't the case for for murder. So when you're assigned to a homicide team. You're usually aware of um, all the other unsolved murders that have gone back, and, and you'll kind of toy around with these and sometimes take them on as a collateral duty. So I always, from the, almost the first days of working robbery homicide, I was either aware of or was actively working some of the unsolved cases, you know, going back 10 or 15 years. But then eventually we decided it was time to open up a detail that would do nothing but, you know, one of the problems you have when you work fresh homicides in addition to old cases is that um, you always have a fresh case that seems to take precedent over the old case. So the old case never gets worked. So unless you dedicate guys to doing just the old case it is and not having to do anything new, nothing ever gets done. So that's, that's why we eventually opened that detail. Working in that world. Now, at that time, you were not a Christian. Is that correct? Well, I, I was. I started working in investigations when I was about maybe, uh, let's see, maybe 30, 31, 30 or so. And um, I was 35 when I became a Christian. So I was working, um, most of my work at the time I was becoming a Christian, that was like robberies, had a couple of homicides, but most of them were robberies and things like that. So one thing I had had a lot of experience with was just speaking to witnesses. And, you know, you very seldom will have a robbery that nobody else sees. And then you have several eyewitness accounts that, that, that seem to differ slightly or offer different variations of the same event. And how these, the texture of these accounts, you know, how they, they kind of connect with one another. It's, you, you come to sense, you, you get used to it. You see it so often that you start to recognize the attributes of reliable witness testimony. And you also recognize pretty quickly who's, who's lying to you. So it, that was kind of my my mindset when I first started looking at the Gospels. I was pretty much aware of, and I was struck immediately by a texture of the Gospels that seemed very similar to multiple eyewitness accounts I had been working. So I just tried to apply the things that I knew were true about people when they're trying to deceive you, and the things I knew were true about uh, reliable eyewitness accounts, and to see if I could apply these templates to the Gospels, and then would they pass if I did? And that was really 
what got me interested in the Gospels to begin with and what eventually convinced me they were true. And the years later, what I wrote about in Cold Case Christianity. I've got some friends who work uh, in the police department, and they've talked to me about some of their own personal struggles when all they see is the negative element. Uh, yeah. You know, that they just see the negative, everything is so negative, and they begin to, to, to look at people suspiciously, mm-hmm. and they noticed it really changed how they relate to other people. Did that happen to you at all? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. That, that this kind of work um, wears on you. And I saw it in my own dad's life, you know, when I was growing up. I was born during his academy. So by the time I was five and he had five years on the job, you know, it, it had started to affect the way he thought about people and the way he reacted. You know, nobody calls us to um, to join their party. They call us to break up somebody else's party. And, and that's, you know, it's a very different uh, kind of environment you're going to be in. No one calls us to celebrate uh, the greatest day their family ever had. They're going to call us on the worst day their family ever had when someone's getting beat up. And then you're going to jump into that mess. And so what you end up seeing time after time after time is the worst in everybody. Um, and, and you know, you'll be careful if that's all you ever see, then don't expect people to, to have a balanced view of people because we don't get to see, you know, this is, this is the difference. You know, there are good people have heart attacks. So when paramedics get rolled out to a scene, they got a good chance that this, they're going to get a regular cross section of humanity, a regular cross section of their, of their, their neighborhood, a regular cross section of their city, because they're going to roll to all kinds of heart attacks and everyone has heart attacks. But when you're a police officer, you're only going to get dispatched to the mess in the city, to the worst parts, the most crime ridden parts where everyone's either a victim or a suspect. And that's not a balanced cross section of any city. And so you you have a much more likely you know uh, chance of being distorted and twisted by that experience. And so I can totally understand where cops are coming from. And also, you know what we do every day in patrol. I, I I've said this a thousand times, especially in the light of all the most recent occurrences. And I've written a couple of blogs on this on my website at coldcasechristianity.com. But I can tell you that I've I've what I've seen is that. You know, people think we just go out every day and we roll around in the city and look for somebody to harass. Or we're looking for, what are we looking for? What are you doing out there? Well, I'll tell you what we're doing. We start every shift reading the crime reports from the day before. That's what we do. We read the crime reports from the days before the shift we're actually working. And what we see in those crime reports is where we're having crimes in our city, in our beats. And who is the, what's the suspect description? on those crimes. And so the next day when we go to work, what do you think we're looking for? We're working those parts of the city where we know we've had an increase in crime of a particular type. And we're looking, if there is a, a suspect description, for the people who fit the descriptions of the, the victims told us were their suspects. We are not deciding who the suspects are. The victims decide who the suspects are based on what they saw and they report it in their crime report and then we're stuck looking for it. So the problem you have is that we are going to end up looking for particular kinds of people, but it isn't like willy-nilly based on what we feel like we want to harass that day. It's always based on the string of crime reports we've had in the days before our shift. So you're kind of stuck. I mean, if you want cops to do that nasty work of having to actually go out and look for guys most of the times guys, who have done crimes, but of course lots of times it's women too. But the point is, if you want us to go look for those suspects in an effective way based on past crimes in our city, are you are you sure you want us to do that? Because what if you happen to look like the suspect that was described yesterday? Are you willing to be detained for a second to find out if you're that guy or gal? And nobody wants that. So we have to make a decision as a culture, I think, just what it is we want our police to do. Do we want our police to be proactive? Do we want them to go out and do that kind of work? Or do we not want them to do that? And I, I can understand either way. I mean, let's, we're going to end up responding to whatever the culture wants us to do. But understand that these two approaches have two different sets of consequences. So we have to be very careful about which one we choose. It is an amazing thing. You're I'm listening to Jay the Rick Warner Altizer Wallace, Show on Bob Radio, 89.1 FM, author, 1160 AM, speaker, Nashville. An apologist. And uh, you can get more information uh, on on Jay and his books and what he's doing at coldcasechristianity.com. So, uh, Jim, I want to put you back into that. Okay, you're not a Christian. 
you're surrounded by all this stuff. You've got evil people. You're surrounded by evil. Uh, you're viewing every day is just seeing the worst of humanity. Are you depressed? Um, no, I'm not. I wasn't. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people uh, probably do feel that way. Um, and I was truly, I mean, we, I, I recognize myself um, then and I recognize it now, my truly fallen nature. Um, I mean, I didn't, as a, as a, as a non-Christian, of course, you don't, you don't want to ever identify that. We're so prideful as humans. And, and the Christian worldview describes this perfectly, right? This idea that we are in the image of God, created in the image of God, yet so wholly rebellious and fallen that this is exactly what we should expect from every walking human being on the planet. Uh, the capacity for incredible beauty, yet also the propensity toward incredible debauchery. You know, that's, that's just the nature of who we are, that enigma of man. And I also had it. And here's how it manifested for me. If you're doing this kind of work and you're seeing the worst again and again and again, you have a tendency to, to start to draw a line in the sand. Those are the bad guys. We are not. And so I had very little patience for any time I would see a report online or see a report in the news of a cop who's acting like a bad guy because I, I expected us to be the exact opposite of them. And what happens is you start to become very prideful. Now, you may work in a city where you have a different, a really a cross-section of races. That wasn't the issue for us. Most of the people I we were in our, in our city, it was relatively racially uh, kind of monogamous. You know, uh, how shall I say it? Um, there was only not a lot of racial diversity in our city. So it, we would divide ourselves in another way. And what I discovered as a non-Christian is something now I understand as a Christian is that we suffer as humans from what I call otherism. It's not racism that's the problem. It's otherism that's the problem. Now, sometimes otherism appears as racism because it's easy to divide over how you look racially, right? But but it doesn't have to appear that way. It can simply be if you've got two guys of the same race, we'll find some other way to divide from one another. And as a cop, how I survived was I survived by um, kind of drawing a line and saying, hey, th those are the bad guys and I'm, I'm one of the good guys. Now, that, that actually, I think, impedes your, your um, path to the cross, if you ask me, because you start to think of yourself as something you're really not. You don't, you don't realize that, no, that's a bad guy over there, and I'm a bad guy standing over here, too. We're all bad guys because we don't, we're not by our nature good. We are, by our very nature, all siblings in our sin. And um, that, that's something that took me a while to figure out, because if you think about it, one of the things that cops do as a mechanism is they, 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 they can give you a lot. They'll give you a lot, but they're not going to say they're lawless. They're not going to – I mean, we are the law. We are, we are the sheriff in town. Uh, when it turns out that that's just a mockery, really, because we're all in need of a savior. You know, the, the, you might be the sheriff, but you're not the savior. And there's two different things there. But I think when you're a non-Christian, there's times when the fact that you're the sheriff might uh, fool you into thinking that you're your own savior, too. So talk to me about uh, your, your, your coming to faith. You're there in the middle of, of working uh, in the uh, police department. You're a homicide detective now by this time. You're working murders. You're seeing darkness. And every day you're just surrounded by this. How did you come to faith? Um, my wife was kind of raised in a culturally Catholic environment. And her mommy did an amazing job of, of, of holding uh, her own Catholic beliefs even though uh, you know nobody else around her really held them, and she raised her two kids to go to, at least go to mass. And now Susie was never somebody who would have. Um, she never discussed her religious beliefs. I don't. She never. We never had owned a Bible. She never read a Bible. Um, if you'd have asked her what the essentials were for being saved, she would have said for sure she believed in God. But I, I don't think you could say she was a Christian in the sense that she didn't even know what Christianity taught in terms of salvation. So we were similarly ignorant, but Susie had it right in the sense that she knew there was something more, and she wanted to raise our kids that way. Now, my dad is still a very committed atheist, and he would be more than happy, though, to go with a believing wife to church. Um, his second wife is a Mormon, and so he, he is more than happy that his kids are being raised LDS, and he's happy that she's LDS. But he's not uh, a believer in anything, and I would have been the same thing. I've been more than happy to go to church as a non-believer. And I did that with her on one occasion. I was 35, walked in, and this pastor was able to 
piqued my interest by just describing Jesus in a way that was relatively pedestrian in the sense that he described him as a, um, you know, he said a lot of things about Jesus that day, but the only thing I really heard that was interesting to me was that he was at the very least the smartest man who ever lived. And the way he said it, you know, um, it was a challenge, right? Because uh, it, my own arrogance would say, really? Okay, what, what makes him so smart? And he argued, you know, that his moral values were, were, were you know, uh, kind of counterintuitive and, and became the foundation for all Western civilization. So you might want to kind of see what Jesus taught. So I went out and bought a Bible. And um, using those things I knew to be true as a detective in order to, and to analyze. And remember, cold cases are cases in which you have a report from 30 years earlier. And sometimes that report is written by a detective who was alive then, who's no longer alive now. And he's describing the actions and the statements of witnesses or suspects or anybody who was alive then but may not be alive now. So you have a very similar kind of a mindset. You're reading reports, describing something that you no longer have access to any of these people. And I thought, well, why couldn't I apply those techniques to the Gospels? And so at some point, I became certain that they were telling me something that was true. And that the Jesus described in those Gospels, um, that that was a reliable eyewitness account of that Jesus. And that, um, of course, that, that, that whole other issue about my predispositions toward naturalism. I didn't believe in miracles. So I would have at first, get, the first step was, yeah, Jesus lived. This has got some truth, but all the miracles cannot be true. Now, I took a step to get through that, and, and I can talk about that later, but, but I got through that, and, but it doesn't make you a Christian. Even if you believed everything that the Gospels tell you about Jesus of Nazareth, you're still not a Christian. You just believe these stories. Uh, it took me another step, another several uh, weeks and months, to, to look for what the Gospels said and what the letters of Paul say, what the entire New Testament in total says about me. So you can just, you can get belief that by examining what the Gospels say about Jesus. But if you want belief in, well, now you've got to look and see what it says about you. And, and as I read through the nature of the fallen man who is in need of a Savior and that nobody chases God, nobody is in, we are all lost in our sin and all deeply rebellious. Those are the statements, the clear statements of Scripture. And as I read them, after being convinced that they were telling me the truth about Jesus, and that I could trust them, then I realized, well, then I can trust them what they say about me. And I remember thinking, I, I can t- now I can't tell you where I was as I, and I, you know, people always say, well, was there a moment? Was there one thing? Well, not really, but I can tell you where I was when I read First Corinthians, because I was on a surveillance. We were doing a surveillance of a guy, and I was not on the eye. I was on a perimeter waiting for this guy that he was at his house and we were waiting for this guy to go out and get in his car and drive around. And so we were all just on a perimeter waiting for him to go. And I was not on the eye. I was just, uh, I didn't have any responsibility. I was just waiting for this guy to go. And, uh, I had time to read. So I was reading my Bible and I would, I just had kind of started, not started, but I've been, you know, working at it for a while, but I was definitely not a Christian yet. And I uh, read through 1 Corinthians, and it just hit me, you know, the whole, both first and second, just the whole, all the letters of Paul, really, just talking about the nature of, you know, especially the natural man re- relative to, and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, that, I mean, Paul's describing me, and I could see myself now, and, and, and prior to this, I, I, would, I couldn't really see myself in the scripture, but, but as I read now, I had a different insight, because I was beginning to trust what it was telling me, and I could see that it was telling me about me. And my own need for a savior, and uh, that's really what started that shift from belief that to belief in. In case you didn't realize it, you're listening to a really nice guy. The Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio, eighty nine point one FM, eleven sixty AM, Nashville. I'm talking with Jay Warner Wallace, former cold case detective, current author, uh, speaker, uh, and let's not let's not forget actor. You've got like you've got like five minutes in the God's Not Dead Two movie dedicated well, to you. Well, actually, I have got six minutes, but I don't want to say anything. Six, about but it. who's counting? Who's counting? You got and uh, they and they mention your name and they and they plug your book. Oh my goodness! 
what kills me is we did that. That's a that's a twelve minute scene, and we did, they cut out six minutes. I mean, the, the extended version is on the DVD. So, but uh, aside from that, yeah, I was pretty happy with it. I mean, I they're you, plugging they, your book. They're plug. They're giving your real name and giving you a plug of your book. It's like, okay, how much did you pay for that? I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> they actually, they actually. Uh, I was, uh, I got uh, like, what is it? Stand in wages that day it was ridiculously a little. But the point was, I knew that that was a movie that um, would probably be a movie that would be seen by the church. Now, what I mean is, you know, I, I, th- I think their hope is that they can use, make a movie that everyone will watch. But, but I know that this is the nature of Christian movies usually. These are movies that really have a very focused audience, right? Right. And, and in the end, you know, nine to one, it's maybe more than that, is going to be Christians watching that movie. And I thought that was exactly the audience that I wanted to reach. Let me tell you why. For the most part, what I've discovered is that those of us who call ourselves Christians, if you were to ask us why we are Christians, you get three answers over and over and over again. The largest answer you get is because I was raised that way. Mm -hmm. That is the number one answer. But the other answers are typically some form of experience, something that you've experienced that demonstrated for you the Christian worldview is true. You just know it's true because you've prayed, had your prayers answered, uh, you've been transformed by Jesus. These are all good reasons to believe Christianity is true. But remember, those are also the same three reasons, you know, experiences or or the fact that um, you were born and raised that way or the fact that, you know, God's transformed you in some way. My Mormon family says that's why they're Mormons. Mm-hmm. So those yeah. three answers that Christians typically give are the same three answers that my Mormon family gives. Mm-hmm. And you don't believe that they're right. If you're a Christian listening to this, you don't think Mormonism is true. But then that's the case. Why would your answers sound like theirs? Mm -hmm. And that was something that was very troubling for me. I write about it in the next book that's coming out next year. But I I just needed to address it. And I thought, if you're going to give me six minutes in a movie that's going to be watched by Christians to demonstrate to Christians that you could actually believe this because it's evidentially true, well, then I'm going to take that six minutes and I'm going to spend it, hopefully, not trying to reach an atheist audience to try to convince you that Jesus is, is, is you know, the historical Jesus is accurately described in the scriptures. But I want the, the Christian audience to realize that you could believe this for a reason you've never had before, which is that you could look at the evidence and determine that it is true evidentially. And, and I'll tell you what. If you just think your experiences are the barometer of truth and that your traditions are the what tell you that something is true, so in other words, raising your family, well, good luck then after you've spent four years in the university when those four years begin to surplant your experiences mm-hmm. in your home and the experiences you have in that school environment supplant the experiences that you, you might. So your traditions have been replaced. Your experiences have been replaced. And now suddenly, how am I going to argue that, that your new, uh, you know, non-Christian worldview uh, doesn't have any merit? If, if, if the only thing that gave your old Christian worldview merit was the same two things, then we're kind of at a, a standstill. I, I, I want my, my young people to know is that this is true. And there may be a season in which you run from it, deny it, or live a different way. I get that. We have all done stupid at some point in our lives. And I always say, if you're going to do that because you want to chase stupid, no problem. Huh. That's on you. But if you're going to do that because you don't think it's true, well, that's on me. I have to, a duty to show you why this is true. Because in the end, you know, you could, if you know it's true evidentially and you've been living inconsistently for a while, you will eventually come back. Because you know it's true. I mean, what are you going to do? And that that truth sets us free. And we're coming to the end of our part one of my interview, and we're going to keep going. We're keep we're going to keep going. And so uh, come back next week to uh, to get the conclusion of our interview. But uh, I've been speaking with Jay Warner Wallace. You can get more information on his books, uh, on his uh, speaking engagements. Uh, his uh, um, uh, growing, burgeoning acting career at huh. col- coldcasechristianity.com. He'll be in Nashville on Saturday, November 12th at the NRB TV Defending Truth Conference. He's going to be at Belmont University there with Erwin Lutzer and Norman Geisler and some and some some fantastic speakers, and, and Jim's going to be there. So uh, you can get information on that at nrbtv.org. Jim, thanks so much for joining us today, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing our conversation. Yeah, me too. I'll see you next week. 
The music you are listening to is from my scripture memory record, and I want to give it to you for free. Just go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and click contact. Altizer is spelled A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. Or how about liking my Facebook page, facebook.com slash show. I want to thank Paul Winkler, the investor coach, for sponsoring this show, and I want to thank you for listening. So be sure to check us out again next week as we discuss how we communicate the gospel through media to our culture. Let's Let's be clear so the world can hear. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. I did not.